Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Linda Levy, the president of the Fragrance Foundation. I'm thrilled to be here today to moderate a very special creative panel event, which is a hallmark event of the Fragrance Foundation. We are very excited to have a wonderful audience, over 500 strong globally. And in this next hour, you will be hearing from Frederick Mall, the perfume publisher, speaking with Carlos Benayim, master perfumer from IFF. This program is so exciting and I haven't heard it yet, but I'm sure this discussion will keep you on the edge of your seat and give you a new perspective on fragrance. Before we start the program and have these gentlemen join me, we're going to show a short video created by Frederick Mall that explains what has happened over the last uh, 20 years as well as where he comes from in the world of fragrance. So please enjoy the video and we'll be right back afterwards to start the discussion. Thanks so much. En fait, je fais quoi dans la vie Je demande aux meilleurs parfumeurs du métier de s'exprimer de la façon la plus libre possible. Et j'ai un rapport avec eux qui ressemble à s'y méprendre à celui d'un éditeur de livres avec ses auteurs. Mon grand-père est mort quelques années avant ma naissance. J'entendais de la part de ma mère que le parfum était une chose importante dans la vie parce que c'était sa vie à elle, parce que c'était son rapport à son père qui avait créé le parfum Dior. Et c'était pour ma mère une façon probablement de continuer la conversation avec son père. Donc j'ai entendu parler du parfum presque comme un, un membre de ma famille. J'ai grandi à, à Paris dans le 7e arrondissement et j'ai appris plus tard que cet appartement Rue de Courti appartenait au Guerlain, mais que non seulement il appartenait au Guerlain, mais que ma chambre était la même chambre que celle de Jean-Paul Guerlain. Il y a un côté prédestiné, peut-être. Dès l'âge de 3 ans, je savais que le parfum était une chose importante et que les odeurs étaient essentielles. Je me rappelle par exemple très bien du grand bouquet de lys blanc qui trônait dans le salon de ma grand-mère à Biarritz. Mon premier parfum d'ambiance, c'était ça. À partir de la fin des années 90, on a l'impression que le parfum n'a plus aucune importance. Tout le monde utilise un peu le même, la même sauce, fait des parfums à taille unique, je dirais, qui plaisent à tout le monde, des parfums Kleenex, pour obéir aux besoins d'une parfumerie libre de service. On se concentre sur une chose, c'est trouver le mannequin, faire un packaging et surtout euh, créer un événement pour lancer le soi-disant parfum. Et le jus, ce que les gens vont porter, ce que les gens vont garder, c'est le parent pauvre. Moi, je suis convaincu quand je vois ça que la parfumerie va mourir. Les parfumeurs à qui je travaille tous les jours ne font que se plaindre. Ils se voient demander par les gens de marketing de faire toujours le même truc, comme si on demandait à un pilote de Formule 1 de devenir chauffeur de taxi. Et de l'autre côté, je vois des gens dans ma vie privée qui mettaient du parfum, et là j'en parle déjà au passé, et qui veulent pas sentir comme tout le monde, et pas sentir comme leur grand-mère non plus. En fait, les gens se sont détournés du parfum, parce que le parfum s'est détourné du parfum lui-même. Mon idée, ça a été juste de remettre le parfum au centre de la conversation. Donc je vais voir les parfumeurs et je leur donne une liberté absolument totale. Je dessine un flacon qui est le plus simple possible, donc un flacon neutre qui ne dit qu'une chose, c'est qualité. Donc il n'y a pas de marketing, pas d'égérie, pas de grand lancement. Tout l'argent qui est dépensé par les autres en habillage du parfum va chez nous dans le flacon. De cet exercice sort des parfums qui sont un peu comme des objets d'art, qu'on édite comme une litho de Warhol en fait. Moi j'ai deux fiertés dans la vie. La première c'est d'avoir été suivi dans une aventure qui semblait complètement folle par les plus grands parfumeurs du métier. Mon autre fierté ça a été de remettre les parfumeurs au centre du débat en fait, de les nommer pour la première fois parce qu'ils étaient inconnus hein, jusqu'à présent. Simplement en, en inscrivant leur nom sur le, le flacon de leur parfum et de faire en sorte qu'ils soient désormais vécus par la profession, mais aussi par le public, comme des auteurs. We have this amazing opportunity to have a discussion with Frederick Mal and Carlos Benaim. And in Frederick's words, he is the editor and Carlos is one of his authors. So Frederick, your connection to fragrance is truly amazing, which we always talk about. 
And thanks for sharing this beautiful film. And congratulations on your 20th anniversary. So welcome. I waited to move to this country in 2006 um, and to be close to Carlos to call him. Uh, and we, strangely enough, although as a consultant before, uh, I had worked with many, many perfumers, we had never worked together. So there was like this discovery phase because I always find difficult. First of all, I'm quite shy. And then I find quite difficult to carve a common language with a perfumer. So I called Carlos to make candles, which is a bit of an affront for a perfumer of his stature. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, uh, um, great fine fragrance perfumers don't work on candles usually. Uh, but Carlos was so modest and so open-minded um, that he accepted and we started communicating like this. Um, and then quickly we uh, started working with on Eau de Magnolia um, and our language, when our language was extremely fluid and, and when communication was completely natural. I mean, soon we discovered that we had so many references in common. Um, you know, we had been, we are all troopers in this business. We have been working and, and, and loving perfumery for so many years um, that we share this passion for all these perfumes that have been made in the past and that they are such a great source of inspiration, but also Carlos is a super modernist, uh, which I very much appreciate in a perfumer. And he's really sort of, you know, um, I mean, he knows techno I mean, technology and raw materials incredibly well. So it's, it's this mix of knowledge of perfumery and perfume history and of search for modernity that I suppose, and curiosity in life in general, uh, that made us work together very easily and become friends eventually. So Carlos, I know that this must have been a very unusual thing for Frederick to come to you and say, let's make candles together. I understand that's not, uh, but nothing isn't unusual in all of these relationships. So for so you, Carlos, I, um, what did you feel like when uh, Frederick first came to you and said, <laughs> let's work on these home scents? Well, when Frederick approached me about working on a line of candles, I was quite surprised. And I was very frank. I told Frederick, you know, I never worked in candles in my life, except when I was a kid. What do you want me to do? And he was very insistent, saying, no, no, the, you know, apply your creativity. You have free range. You can create the most beautiful fragrances for the home. Just, you know, go, go for it. And my curiosity was piqued. And also, um, we started communicating and I realized that, as Frédéric mentioned, we have so much in common. And one of the things that we have in common, one of the personalities that we have in common was a, one of the heads of IFF research, Dr. Braja Mukherjee, who was a, a brilliant scientist uh, whose motto was, when, when you are close to nature, when you are studying nature, it's like you are kissing the feet of God. Like he was religious and he was really an, an incredible person. And both Frédéric and I had great admiration for him. And so we found a novel approach to get into those candles, something that had never been done before, which is why don't we use the fine, you know, the living flower technology um, to approach this, this new world. And living flower technology, for those who, who do not know what it is, uh, was discovered by Dr. Braja Mukherjee, and it's the way of studying uh, the composition of a flower or a plant while it's still in the bush without destroying it by inserting a needle that is coated with some kind of a wax that takes all the molecules that are around the flower, and then you inject that in a mass spec. The mass spec tells you all the composition. Of course, it's never exact, and it's very, very hard for us to reproduce it, but that was the idea. So when um, we decided to work on this, and we went to the Magnolia, for instance, <clears throat> it was a natural way 
to, to, you know, Magnolia has always been a passion for me to get. It was a flower that was very much of interest to me because it, not only it's a beautiful blossom, but also it has a, a lemony effect. So in order to understand that, because you cannot even extract it, so we applied the uh, living flower technology and using that information, we were able to create a candle. You know, you both, everyone talks about creative process, but this idea of thinking of the two of you uh, jamming like in a garage with musical instruments almost um, brings but to mind. I could take, for instance, an example and, and describe one of the, you know, we were talking about the magnolia, for instance. Um, I was passionate about that flower. I remember even once I was in Portofino and I was so entranced by it that there was down a ravine, several beautiful magnolia trees in blossom. And I nearly feel myself trying to smell one of those flowers hanging over the edge. To me, it was very important to understand that. <laughs> and so once you, you start with a sketch of a magnolia, which could come from a living flower technology, it could come from what we know about magnolia, from an odor to a fragrance that you can wear, is a big stretch. You have to spend months of work, if not years sometimes, to, to be able to adapt it to the skin. And for us, uh, I remember that towards the end of it, one of the most significant steps which I really surprised me <clears throat> is one of the ingredients that we don't use anymore for some reason, the moss, became a very important ingredient in that combination to give the sensuality to the note wow. um, and uh, so I remember it always and, and that was uh, Frédéric's idea you know we were nearly the end and he said why don't we try that oh well and it worked so that's how we work together but and it's, it, it's things that you know an idea like this comes from a knowledge of how perfume were made in the past and then you think like oh it, it, we People use those ideas in the past, but if you put it in a different context, it becomes very modern. Um, and this is the kind of conversations that we have. And, and when you work with someone that knows perfumery like Carlos does, I mean, <clears throat> I remember your face. I remember that day very well, actually. I remember your face. It was like, oh, okay, why not? Uh, and it was like, not <laughs> completely stupid. Let's try that. And, um, and because you already saw it. <laughs> to me, all the suggestions are welcome. I'm very curious and I want to try everything. And, uh, and I understand that sometimes you have ideas that are even more to the point than the ones I might have. So I'm willing to try. Really? <laughs> <laughs> well, you play well together. Okay, this was very important, Frederick, to Carlos. We talked about this. So, Carlos, um, could you share with us what you think Frederick's contribution is and has been to the world of perfumery? I think Frederick's contribution to the world of perfumery has been revolutionary and um, and radical until. 20 or 30 years ago, <clears throat> the perfumers were really treated as ghostwriters. We had no name. Uh, so imagine, for instance, that you have a, a, a new song and the singer is anonymous. It's Beyonce, but it's anonymous. Or you have a, a major, uh, you know, like War and Peace written by anonymous author. Or a, or a film where uh, Leonardo DiCaprio is totally anonymous. It doesn't make any sense. And I think that, that Frédéric called that, and by putting the name of the perfumer in the bottle, he really took a radical approach. And he gave the perfumer, the, you know, the perfumer became an author that is celebrated, a creator that is celebrated for his and or her creation, uh, celebrated, acknowledged, recognized, and all of a sudden, 
the press is interested. And it changes completely what happens in this world. In the last 20 years, the perfumer have be, has become a central player in the evolution of a fragrance, thanks to Frédéric. So the second very important contribution that Frédéric has done to perfumery is that he has allowed us to work without any price constraint. Just the most important thing is the aesthetics of the fragrance, the creativity, and you can use any ingredient, the most beautiful or the worst, anything synthetic, natural, whatever you want to use is okay. So imagine if you are a cook and all of a sudden you are told, okay, you can use truffles, you know, white truffles or caviar or anything you want, the best wines or do whatever you want, just put your creativity at work. And that is what Frédéric has done. And I think that has brought back the perfumery to the way we, it used to be 50 years ago. And, it has, and today we have perfumery of much higher quality, thanks to him. So I think um, the perfumery world and the perfumers in particular owe Frédéric a big debt of gratitude. Thanks. But you know, one thing that I wanted to do and that I'm proud that I think we have done all together is to show that you could make extraordinary perfumes although modern, because when we started this little adventure 20 years ago, I mean, fine fragrances were, fine perfume was, was disappearing, but also people were convinced that you, great perfumery was either 100% natural, which is false, and or that you had to make a reference to the past and make perfumes like before to make them great. And I thought that it was worth showing that, one, they were extraordinary perfumers and extraordinary artists. Uh, two, that those artists were like contemporary artists. They didn't have to write like in the 19th century or draw like in the 19th century. Perfumery is an art that can go forward and is very much of our time. And I think that what we have done all together is to really prove that there is such thing as a modern fine perfumery, like there is a contemporary art. It, says, it sounds like completely obvious today, but 20 years ago it wasn't. I mean, when you look at even people that were trying to make luxury perfumes, they always had 19th century or 1900 looking bottles. Mm -hmm. They always refer to the past. And that, that idea of modernity was very dear to me, to me. As for naming perfumers, to be honest, I, until the end, I thought that there was something wrong. Because to me, it was completely obvious. Not only it was a great story, not only you are, many of you are interesting and great, you know, interesting to talk about, but it was also justice. <laughs> and I did not understand why no one had done it before. And it was almost like a, as if there was like a hidden camera in the room and there was something like where I was thinking like, oh, am I doing something very stupid? Is, this, is there something wrong in doing this? It seems so obvious to me why no one has done it. And to now, to, till now, and it's not to be falsely modest, I still don't understand um, why no one had done it. It was obvious. I think the smartest things that happen in life are the ones that seem obvious, but they have not occurred in life. Mm -hmm. I used to call it the Wizard of Oz in fragrance. You know, there was a big curtain and someone was behind the curtain and we never knew um, who it was. So I am not just saying this because uh, Carlos is being so kind about explaining the process, but you know, I grew up before I met you, Frederick and Carlos, in uh, the department store world for a phase. And before that, I was in marketing. And when I got there, I kept saying, how come we never talk about the perfumer? It, I didn't have the knowledge oh, yes. of that, but I was very upset about it. So when I finally got to this position and I met you, that's why you are the game changer extraordinaire, because it's, you say it's obvious but it's everything. Carlos, just like you said, if you don't know the author, you don't know what you're smelling. So 
I, I, we have this in common, all of us. I think that today, a lot of people are spending hours <clears throat> talking about ingredients, but they miss the point where ingredients are important, but they are names. Yes. And the way you use them makes them so, I mean, react in such a different way. But the style of each perfumer, to me, is absolutely, it's probably the most important thing. Because they are, it's, it's like the writing of, of an author. It's like painting. Uh, it's like a, a painter using different type of paints. You know, if you look at the way Van Gogh had, his favorite color was cobalt blue. You know, and cobalt blue is not a natural color. It's a, it comes of a chemistry set uh, done by chemists. Uh, what was important, the cobalt blue or Van Gogh? In fact, it's Van Gogh who was able to use this novelty that came uh, from the chemical industry. So I think that in perfumery, we just to, to do a, a parallel, we advance perfumery also by using these ingredients, whether they are natural or synthetic, that come out of our factories and our industry and, and that make the, the world of perfumery advance. But I agree with you that the artist is the key, using these novel ingredients to make perfumery move forward. You make it very simple. Okay, we're now going to switch the channel a little and we're going to talk a bit about um, fragrance business in the United States of America. Not so much the retail environment, but the consumer and the difference. So I do need to intro this because besides Carlos working with Frederick and creating great fragrances, and we're gonna talk more about those, this gentleman has created iconic American fragrances and he had to change the channel a little when working with Frederick. So if anyone doesn't know, Polo Green, the original, came from Carlos, and the biggest one that everyone always talks about, Polo Blue, which is incredible and still so strong out there. Also a little Calvin Klein Eternity for Men on the was unbelievable. So a lot of um, men's fragrances, but then um, Elizabeth Taylor White Diamonds from my alma mater, by the way, every Christmas at Macy's, that is one of the biggest fragrances that sells. It's incredible and iconic. And anyone who ever meets Carlos and finds out that he's the man behind Flower Bomb, it's sort of, uh, that's more your celebrity status at times, <laughs> Carlos. And last but not least, because the list is so very long, um, you know, Yves Saint Laurent has a lot of great fragrances and a lot of those men's fragrances come from Carlos, but the one that debuted this year, um, YSL Libra is really um, here to stay and the new modern YSL. So. Carlos, with that long repertoire of so many American fragrances that everyone knows about. Over so many years, it's amazing. It's, and that's just a tip Pretty of cool. the iceberg. What I'd love you gentlemen to share with all of us is what is the American consumer versus the consumer in the rest of the world? Or, and what is your aesthetic vision or viewpoint of the USA versus or New York versus Paris. Give us a little feeling for how you see the world of fragrance from those two vantage points. In my case, when uh, I came from, from, Paris, from Europe, and when I was a kid, I came to this country when I was 22, and I used to wear Sauvage. It was my favorite fragrance. Like, I think it's yours also. It was yours, right, uh, Frédéric? My mother worked on that. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. And it used to be my favorite fragrance, but when I came to this country, I realized that it had absolutely no appeal to the American consumer. It was like if it didn't exist. Mm. So I started rethinking completely, and I think that fragrances have to reflect the, the personality of, of the country. Mm -hmm. what, is, what is America about, uh, at least at that time? It was about you know very straightforward the whole politesse was you know the whole introductory thing and politesse and was not there as much as the directness of the of the message 
and the, and the bold message. And so that's when I started working on, on fragrances like Polo, where it was the complete opposite, because I understood that that's what the country needed. I think that was has what has happened over over the years, uh, and we have seen the the whole emergence of of American perfumery over these years. I, I kind of witnessed uh, American perfumery. I was at the beginning of it because I made the first fragrance for from, from uh, Ralph Lauren, the first fragrance for Calvin Klein, and of course before that Josephine Catapano had created the first fragrance for Estee Lauder, mm. which had been really the birth of American perfumery uh, in yeah. its present stage. And, you know, all the, uh, uh, like for instance, Norel as an American designer. Um, so all that American perfumery established itself and it was characterized by strength, by, by uh, boldness, by beauty, by high concentrations. Uh, and it was not so refined, you know, when I say refined, it was not so chiseled. It was really in your face. And that's what mm -hmm. the public wanted. I think that what ha happens with globalization also in recent years is that there has been more of a confluence of influences. Um, American perfumers are creating French fragrances and French perfumers are creating American fragrances. Uh, mm -hmm. Things are becoming, of course, there is a clear preference in, in the public. In, in, in the American consumer likes more the fresh and clean and, and uh, also in some cases, whereas the, the French is more characterized by the acceptance of animal notes or quote unquote, dirty, sexy notes. Um, but, you know, in fact, there is a big globalization that is taking place and a beautiful fragrance. Um, appeals to many, many people across the ocean. Of course, with China, sometimes you find big surprises because sometimes uh, what is liked in China is a bit of a shock for us, uh, but we learn how to adapt to it and to create not only for what we like, but for what they like. And we are able to to ex, you know to expand our horizon like that. Um, what do you think? Today? I mean, I, I share all of what you have said. Um, I grew up with a survival as well, and then um, there was this thing called American perfumery when I was a child, which was the sort of brasher, bigger perfumes, and I personally loved them right away. And I must say that when I started going out, I was probably the only kid in Paris wearing an American perfume, which was Holston Z14, uh, which still today I consider a very, very important and good perfume. Uh, then when I came here to study, I was absolutely mesmerized by the spectacle of Madison Avenue with all these ladies smelling so much stronger than anyone in Paris. Um, and there was two main tastes now that I see that in hindsight, which was Orientals and Tuberose, because this is how you get power. Um, and then you were raining on Madison Avenue as far as, ma as men, were con men were concerned, because it was Polo Land. Uh, so it was, it was, I mean, that's what men smell of. Um, now, I think that our taste in France has been probably a little bit more consistent because there was a strong reaction in America against those very strong perfume. And it was almost like uh, an arms battle when France answered with poison uh, and things like that, and probably went as far as one could go. Uh, and it was a reaction in America about, which was, you know, the sort of puritanical side of America and the PC side of America, sort of, Pull the, the, the I mean, uh, perfume the other way. And there was a reaction which was probably CK1, which was those very citrusy perfumes, which we thought had no future in America. America went completely the other way. Um, as in France, um, 
people are less in your face, probably. People are less, don't want to declare their personality as much. People are sort of flying a little bit more under the radar. People and friends never want to show their wealth, remember that. Um, so everything has to feel very natural as, as if you were sort of, you know, uh, as if it was coming from generations and generations. And so you had sexy perfumes like your Shalima or Miss Carvajal, for instance, have always been around. Um, but they cohabitate with all sorts of different perfumes and we probably put a bit less than what America used to wear in the 80s. Now, America has probably sort of gone to what Carlos was saying towards globalization. Because of globalization, now there's like a happy medium in America. And perfumes like Flower Bomb that Carlos made are sort of doing well everywhere. Um, and then when it comes to making very um, high-end perfumes, like what I do in life, uh, I see that um, America, America is still very true to tuberose when I see the success of a caramel flower. Um, I mean, this is, it's a success worldwide, but it's, it's, it's a status perfume in America. Uh, but a portrait of a lady is doing well everywhere. And Olo Magnolia is doing well everywhere. Um, Vitiva Extraordinaire is doing well everywhere. Um, so it's become, I mean, those, those tendons, those, um, I mean, we have a little bit more of a globalization, but in an individualistic way, let's say that I believe that Europe, and especially France and Europe, uh, France, probably Spain, were ahead of the curve in the 60s and 70s because we had been wearing perfumes for much longer and we had been making perfumes for much longer. Uh, as for America or Germany, actually, there are Protestant country where people are not supposed to smell. Um, they discovered perfume a bit later. And so like something you discover, you have this hunger for it. And in the 60s, 70s, 80s, people will like, like a child who hasn't been allowed to eat chocolate, he's gonna eat tons of chocolate, uh, were, were wearing a lot. And then there was probably an indigestion of this. It was probably, it was probably, it, it, it reached probably an excess. And then now things are bouncing back. And, and the difference between the two markets is not that huge, um, but people are more in both sides, more individualist or individualistic um, in the sense that somewhere we're not Cologne, somewhere we're an Oriental, somewhere we're tuberose. And then you have a few traits that sort of remain in America, like this love for white flowers, things like that. Wow. Am I saying something wrong, Carlos, or is it right? No, it's correct. It's correct. <laughs> No. You've been validated. No, I think it's, I, I need that. <laughs> so, if carnal flower or a portrait of a lady or yeah. ode to magnolia um, are fairly universal or global, talk to yeah, us are. about music for a while because that's the a very interesting fragrance that you developed together. What was the inspiration, and how would you describe the person that wears it? It's a uh, yeah. It, the, the inspiration was, I mean, we wanted to go into an oriental perfume um, with a very strong side of lavender. And lavender, you know, those natural um, <laughs> ingredients have many aspects to them. And lavender has a linked vanilla. So, I mean, the idea was to create a chain. Uh, and from vanilla, you can um, you, you can create a link with amber and with patchouli. So we had this sort of triangle, this square um, that we, I mean, that Carlos sort of knitted gradually. Um, and then there was this interesting addition at the end, uh, which was this touch of pineapple, which Carlos thought would work 
um, with um, the, 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 the sweet part of the perfume, uh, with the vanilla aspect of it. So it's, it's really a construction of the mind. Uh, and it's really, it's, again, it's a bit like sculpture. It's, it, it's trying to find the shape. Um, but we know we knew that doing that we were going into the land of sexy sex appeal uh, because that has every single ingredient uh, that God has been given us to make anyone <laughs> sexy. And, <laughs> and wait a minute, wait a minute. And Carlos, I have to give you a little secret here. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> and then Tell the us. secret is Carlos, who knows how what what's a sexy perfume. No, I have, a, no, sexy. have a secret Please. on top of. Yeah. Um, one day, I have Braja who came to Braja Mukaji who came to see me, and he told me that I think I have discovered the secret of patchouli. And patchouli is not just the patchouli alcohol that everybody thinks is the main ingredient, but there are a couple of other ingredients, a couple of other molecules that are super important in patchouli, and I have made them together by creating it from natural patchouli oil, something called healing wood that enhances all these molecules together. So I started playing on an accord between healing wood and lavender with an oriental character. And that's when Frédéric saw that accord that that in a way um, started as a as a, an oriental uh, using some modernized classic notes and that's mm -hmm. why the name is so fitting the name you chose is so fitting because you know patchouli is on lavender are eternal notes in perfumery but what kind of patchouli was used was completely different from the patchouli that was used in the old fragrances. This was completely different. And the lavender were qualities that developed at Laboratoire Monique Rémy, which also were of a different level of quality. So it was a way of taking um, a central accord and making it modern. And then from there, we started working together, as you so well described it. And, and, uh, and the final idea of putting the pineapple, note, which surprised me because it came from you, worked very well. Um, and really uh, put the uh, just icing the, on the cake. Put the cherry on the cake. Yes. <laughs> that is a secret ingredient. But I never knew pineapple was in it. So, you know, it goes back to what you were saying before. Just a touch. Who but it's very it? present now. It's fantastic. Woo! That's Because when you think of how a pineapple is made, it has a lot of that um, vanilla type uh, of ingredient that Carlos used. So I thought, like, oh, maybe that's going to sort of, you know, we create chains. So you think about the chains, and then you know you try things. Sometimes we, sometimes it works. So in that case, the fragrance was developed, and it was at the very end where you determined that you would call it music for a while. Is that the norm? Yes, actually, it was quite difficult because when you make a perfume which is as sort of super sexy as that, um, I find that I mean. These names have been, you know, we have, first of all, in, in, our, uh, in our collection, we have a perfume called Muse Cravageur. That's as sexy a name as it can be. And all these names have been used and reused and used again. And so I didn't want to have another name in that thing and that's in that realm. And that's when my job becomes difficult. And I was saved as often by uh, listening to music. Uh, I, I listen to uh, religiously, and, and this has been going for decades, to um, a, a radio show, which is a very old radio show in France, on French radio, um, called La Tribune uh, des Critiques de Disque, where you have a bunch of eggheads 
uh, musical critics sort of uh, um, uh, deciding on what's the best recording of a certain type of music, of a certain piece of, of classical music. And it's like expertise to a uniquely French level. And you can, this is a podcast that you can get whatever you want. And I was actually driving in Los Angeles. So it was completely exotic. I mean, I had Paris in my car when I was in Los Angeles. And, and listen, listening to uh, uh, this show, which was that week about Purcell, the English composer. And there is this piece by Purcell called um, Music for a While. Uh-huh. And I thought not, not only the piece of music was beautiful, but it was such a suggestive name for a perfume because it is a reference to, uh, to Baroque music, but it's also, you know, music for a while, the music can be anything. It can be seduction. It has a little abstraction. I thought that it had this sort of uh, delicacy of Carlos' style, but yet it's quite broad. Um, so I called Carlos and said, you know, I heard about a name, which uh, I, I thought of a name, listening to the radio, which I think might be right for what you have done. And Carlos liked it. So that's how that worked. So, you know, it's um, saved by the French, by, by French podcast. <laughs> I think it fits perfectly, frankly. It works. I think, I think still. Amazing, gentlemen. So let's switch back to something you've touched on before. It sounds like there are a lot of different inspirations. You, Carlos, talked about practically falling off the cliff in Portofino, smelling um, flowers, and you were driving on the highway just now in Los Angeles. Was and we've, we've uh, sorry to interrupt, uh, oh. the, the, but you know that um, when we were working on Jurassic Flower, I yeah. remember having my portrait done by a very slow photographer <laughs> on the middle of Sydney. I mean, completely jet-lagged, wanting to die, to be <laughs> honest. I mean, it's one of those things, it's, it's a little bit like, you know, I don't know if you've seen this movie, Lost in Translation, where Bill Murray is being tortured. So I felt very much like that. And I was kept on being, trying to be so nice and I wanted to kill. And it was in a flower shop yeah. And they gave me a branch of magnolia. And the only thing that I was thinking about, because we were working with Carlos on this, was, you know, the amount of linalol that could go in there. And I had the magnolia. So all I was interested in is smelling the flower instead of smiling to the guy in front of me. It took even longer. Uh, but the it's a sort of obsessive. <laughs> so I text Carlos that day from wherever I was. Because <laughs> we were, it's funny how life sends you this. I mean, you know, when you work on a perfume uh, like this, and when you are so lucky to work with someone at, that has Carlos's talent, you have to be completely dedicated. Or, I mean, actually, it's natural to be dedicated. And so, everything in your life can be an opportunity to sort of, you know, influence that subject that you were working on. It is going to feed you. Um, so that was a typical example. Oh my gosh. That rem- since you're talking about a, um, photograph in your book, um, Frederick, there is a little, I wouldn't call it an illustration or a cartoon. It's, it's in a class by itself. It's in the, se- in the chapter at the author's service. And there's Carlos with his lab sample. Oh yes. It's done by my friend Constantin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I and love it. Gonna- I wrote to Carlos. I said, is this you, Carlos? He says, it is Carlos. There is only one Carlos. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about this sketch. It's very much the way we work, actually, because Constantin, um, I can't remember if Constantin came or if, I think it's my assistant. It might be Eglantine, who now works at IFF, who took the picture yeah. um, with my phone. And I gave it to, it's, you know, it's in Carlos's, office or at Carlos's office I mean we haven't been working like this for a long time sadly but um, eventually we'll go back um, and um, so it's very much the way we work I mean we're on each side of that table and spending things and exchanging ideas um, and it's always the same rhythm of smelling in silence concentrating then 
chatting about, I mean, chatting, I mean, telling precisely what we think is right and not right. Usually I have a piece of paper where I write my own impressions, just not to keep, not to lose my train of thought. Um, and then Carlos, if necessary, reformulating on his computer, that goes to the lab where his assistants compound the perfume. And it's that sort of eternal movement. But I think there was one part that is also extremely interesting yeah. is in between the experiments. Because in between the experiments, we, we talk. And we talk about anything and everything, from architecture to art to people, about people, about perfumers, about perfumes. And sometimes even ideas come out of that. But the beauty of the exchange, which is not only the, that's why I always look forward to sitting with you to work, is that it becomes a, a, a kinship, like a <clears throat> complicity in a way, where we can exchange ideas and work at the same time, and it becomes extremely uh, pleasant. Uh, thanks for mentioning this, Carlos. Not only because I'm flattered, but it's um, it's also how this whole idea of Edition Parfum as a company began. It's this rhythm that we have is the same with every perfume because that's, that's the way our business works. Um, we concentrate, we smell, we reformulate, or perfume, you reformulate, I don't. Um, For me, staying home in New York City all this time, I know that people have a bit of a renewed interest in fragrance, which is extremely exciting to me. So if you could each tell us, let's start with what do we think it is today, given the conditions, but in your crystal ball, um, what do you think is the future for fragrance? Carlos, should we allude to Jean? Sorry, we speak French with each other all the time, it's horrible. <laughs> go you, go ahead. Go, you go ahead and then I'll give you more. All right, so two things. First of all, today, I think that this is a very strange time in history for all the reasons that we know. And I think that people need reassurance. And um, they are, people are not meant to go out and are going to be sort of staying home in a fairly anxious state for a while. And this is, you know, it's what it is. And I think perfume, as Carlos said before, reflects not only a country, but also a state of mind. and. I think that we are going, you know, after going from being super fresh and clean to super sexy and everything in the middle, uh, we are re going to rediscover that perfumes can be soothing and reassuring. And um, as they were meant to be in the past, I mean, perfume uh, had all sorts of functions uh, in the past, even taking, helping people uh, in the afterlife. and. Um, I think that today um, we're going to work more and more on perfumes that are sort of comforting. Um, and so that's, that's that. As for the future, I really don't know what it's going to hold. I mean, as always, perfumes, good perfumes, will, will have a very strong personality, will be innovative, will be very specific. That's that's eternal. That's what a good perfume is and will be mingling with one skin. But what I think very important to remember is that perfume is a technological art. We always depend on what chemistry brings to us. And, you know, in the 70s, Galaxolid came, uh, Iso Super, um, all those extraordinary ingredients, Cachemiran, um, that IFF discovered, and um, and you know, and, and other labs created others, but uh, and that created a whole vocabulary that allowed people like Carlos to create the perfumery of the eighties and and later and until now, uh, and maybe they will be, and we are very dependent on the new color that the chemist will add to the rainbow in the future. So this, I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball. Uh, maybe Carlos knows more, but uh, because he's, he knows 
the secrets of IFF better than I do. But it's but it's um, uh, it's it, it's what what we are we are very much dependent on. As for naturals, um, I mean, I think that we have never used better naturals. I mean, they are more refined than ever. Um, great sources, great. I mean, people like Laboratoire Monique Remy are extraordinary at, at, at extracting those uh, in, in such a rigorous way, uh, naturals, and, and the control is amazing. So that's how you get, you know, the type, type of Turkish rose that you have in Portrait of a Lady, of tuberose that you have in Cauliflower and so on. Um, uh, and the vitiver for Haiti from uh, Vitiver Extraordinaire and so on. Um, so I think this is also important because we are going to have a lot of, not new naturals, but sort of like super refined naturals uh, that we already have today um, in, uh, in perfumers palette. I mean, I mean, you know, people like Carlos depend on what they have to work. So Carlos, without giving oh. out the secrets. <laughs> He's going to uh, give them. He's very good at that. I know. <laughs> well, I think that, um, Perfumery advances with with new ingredients, and I think it is the role of our industry, of IFF and others, to to provide those. And let it, they could be naturals or they could be synthetics. Um, that's what makes perfumery move forward. But what I see in the ingredients is that there will be a complete renewal of the perfumer's palette in the next 10, 10 or 20 years. I think it will be oh, wow. <clears throat> much more um, sustainable, much more green. The methods of production will completely change. The, there will be much more biotechnology involved, uh, not only chemistry, but biotechnology. Um, and I think that the palette of the perfumer in the next 10, 20 years will be very different, which would be, a, which is to me, a great advance. It will allow us to move forward. Um, and of course the perfumers will always be there because, you know, uh, the sense of smell is one of the five senses and, <clears throat> and there is a necessity of art for each one of the senses to fulfill each one of the senses, whether it is the, 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 the vision with the painting or the music for the ear. And it's the same for the sense of smell. We need to nourish it with, with art. And that's something that has existed since the beginning of time and it will continue forever. So I think we, we have a bright future in perfumery that will continue with new ingredients, new perfumers who will do wonderful things in the future. Wow. There's also, I think, a new generation of perfumers, um, which is very talented. I think that uh, the, um, there's a gener I mean, the golden generation of the Carlos of that world. Um, was followed by a generation that had to work for marketing and was not as challenged as and and freed as you guys were, uh, like Jean Claude, you, Pierre, and, and so on. Um, but the new generation, the one that are under 30 today, are not only extremely well schooled, but people like you. Uh, so they are sort of virtuosos, they can play. Uh, but also they have grown in at a time makes me feel very old uh, at a time where um, companies like mine were already in existence and where there was a new focus on fine per, fine perfumery um, and they also have a very good knowledge of classics so one plus the other it makes them more ambitious and more free and more yeah more hungry for creation. And so there is not only this palette that Carlos is talking about, which is essential, uh, but it's also there. There are going to be new talents that are kind of that are in the making, uh, which I think is very interesting. 
exciting. We are constantly training new perfumers at IFF, and we have a, a, a wonderful school, which was very different from the way I learned. I learned more like in the old masters, where you basically go to a place where you have the old master telling you what to do and mm -hmm. how to do it, mm -hmm. to, a, to a real schooling system where you can learn as you would learn in, in university, which is something I didn't have as a, as a child, as a young person. Uh, I learned more by experience and by being next to the masters in a way. And so the new perfumers are very lucky today. They, are, they inherit a world where, as you say, fine fragrance is, is very much at the, at, the, at the foremost, the height of it. And they are also extremely well schooled and trained. So that passion will, will come up with fantastic results in the future. I think so. Everyone really appreciates the fact that on your 20th anniversary, Frederick, and after this magnificent relationship with Carlos, that you're sharing all that you are today because we may be staying at home, but for one hour, they've escaped to hear a story that is simply extraordinary. So I cannot thank you enough. On thank you. Thank you very much, Linda. Thanks for having us. gentlemen. Thank you all for joining us today for this very exciting discussion at the Fragrance Foundation Creative Panel event. We want to have a big thank you to Frederick Mall and Carlos Benaim for spending time with us. And you'll all be pleased to know if you want to watch it again and hear those wonderful words again, we will feature the entire event on the Fragrance Foundation website. And we'll feature little snippets on our social media. So please join us at Fragrance Foundation on Instagram. And feel free to repost hashtag TFF Creatives. Thank you all very much for joining us. Your time is valuable, and I hope you enjoyed every minute as much as I did. Stay healthy, stay safe, and we'll see you again.